Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to today's session. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. My name is Kim Finney, and I, along with my colleague, Kathy Moxon, are the co-founders of the Rural Youth Catalyst Project. We're a working group of the Rural Assembly led by Whitney Kimball Coe. 50 years ago, in 1971, Congress passed the 26th Amendment, which lowered the voting age to 18. This seemingly simple amendment took decades of hard advocacy and was part of a larger series of hard-won civil rights legislation. Beginning during World War II, young people began organizing for their right to vote with the phrase, old enough to fight, old enough to vote. The fight for the right to vote was inextricably tied to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Vietnam War. A little known fact, in 1942, it was a Democratic congressman from the rural state of West Virginia named Jennings Randolph who first introduced federal legislation to lower the voting age. Congressman Jennings would introduce the bill 11 times. Congressman Jennings fiercely believed in the role that young people and especially rural young people play in our democracy. At the time he remarked, they possess a great social conscience, are perplexed by the injustices in the world and are anxious to rectify those ills. Despite the current perceptions of the rural voter, rural young people have always been on the front lines in the fight for civil rights, both 50 years ago and today. Young people are exercising their right to vote at historic rates, yet not everyone has the same access to the ballot box, especially rural young people and specifically rural BIPOC youth. This afternoon, we are honored to collaborate with CIRCLE, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement at Tufts University, as part of their celebration and examination of the 26th Amendment entitled Fulfilling the Promise. Thank you, CIRCLE. Thank you, Abby and Alberto, for letting us join you. Together, we are honored to bring you this intergenerational panel of civil rights leaders from across the country. Today, you'll hear the perspectives of women that were part of the founding of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the newer voice of a fierce community organizer from Laredo, Texas, along with the expertise of Circle's applied research on youth voting and civic engagement. This conversation is being moderated by two brilliant and powerful women that I'm honored to know, Marlene Klua and Amanda Heard Shelby. Amanda is the Young Women's Leadership Program Director for the Children's Defense Fund, the Southern Regional Office, and the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative for Social and Economic Justice, where she directs the United Blackwell Young Women's Leadership Institute, a program that reached its 15th year in 2020. Amanda is dedicated to seeing young people, in particular young women of color, learn life lessons, control their own narratives, and lead while growing. Ms. Fudge works, Verge, sorry Amanda, Ms. Verge works in, as a writer, publishing her first collection of non-fictional stories about growing up in Mississippi, motherhood, and art, and is a multimedia performing artist. I've had the honor of working with Marlene Pua for over a decade. She is the Climate and Clean Energy Coordinator for Stoic Energy Consulting and a Rio Grande Valley girl at heart. Marlene's advocacy work is fueled by her own personal narrative, growing up in a colonia, being raised by a single mother, and having worked as a migrant farm worker. Marlene knows firsthand the hardships perpetuated by racial inequities and poverty. Previously, she worked with JOLT Initiative, where she developed and managed strategies for engagement and impact, ranging from climate justice campaigns to leadership pro programming for Latinx youth. Marlene also worked as the Texas, with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid for over a decade. She brings a wealth of knowledge in project man management, collaborative partnerships, community advocacy on a local and statewide level, and creating robust campaigns planning and representing the narrative of the borderlands and Latinx communities. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Amanda and Marlene and all of our panelists. And without further ado, I turn it over to you to lead the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Kim, you have been an incredible guiding light <laughs> on this side. And so we appreciate you so much. 
We, on behalf of myself and Marlene, I wanna thank the Rural Assembly, the Rural Youth Catalyst Project and Circle for this opportunity to have this conversation um, on this platform with these incredible minds. So we're gonna get right into it. Um, Miss Mamie Cunningham, in summation, uh, she first became involved in the civil rights movement as a student in 1964 at Russ College, where along with other students from across the country, she began registering people to vote. Because of her work that summer, she was chosen as an observer to travel with Fannie Lou Hammer, Stokely Carmichael, um, Bob Moses, Robert Moses, who passed away recently, rest in peace, Reverend Ed King, and just so many of these civil rights giants that we honor and recognize. Her work has continued in social justice in public schools as a teacher and advocate as well as in local government. So thank you, Miss Cunningham, for joining us uh, this afternoon. And then I have to bring in our local statistician <laughs> for this conversation. Uh, Ms. Abby is the Deputy Director of CIRCLE. Um, if you don't know who CIRCLE is by now on this call, it's just a Google click away. Um, <laughs> she is, um, her CIRCLE's research informs policy and practice for healthier youth development and a more inclusive democracy and is part of Tuff University's Tisch College of Civic Life. Um, I think when I met Abby, she was across the country, <laughs> across the globe, the last time we talked. And so we are excited to hear uh, what she's going to bring to this conversation um, as far as research and just her own opinion. And I'm going to turn it over to Marlene. Well, hi, good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing and honor uh, Carol Blackman who is in her third year as the Senior State Organizing Manager in Mississippi for Black Voters uh, Matter Fund. Her work is conducted statewide with organizational partners and allies to promote expanded democracy in the Black community. She manages more than 20 Black Voter Matter partners across the state. By expanding the capacity of these partners, um, Black Voter Matters promotes voter education, mobilization, voter registration, and active voter participation. She was also a senior consultant with uh, Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative for Economic and Social Justice. And she has a long history of working for human rights, economic development, and social justice. She believes that when we work together, we all win. And that is so true, Carol. <laughs> People power. Um, and then um, I also have the pleasure of introducing Juan Ruiz, who's from the border region. He's a community advocate based in Laredo, Texas. He helped organize residents across Webb and Zapata counties to fight against the border wall, which led to the cancellation of two border wall contracts. He also has been a field organizer for the Rio Grande International Study Center, where he worked on the nexus of climate and civic engagement. And he currently is volunteering for Congressional Texas District 28 candidate Tanya Benavides' campaign. So we are so excited to have such a tremendous um speakers today for a panel discussion so with that i think we can kick it off amanda with the yeah. first question <laughs> so our first question considering the context of this conversation and how we're celebrating i don't know celebrating might be a trigger word i don't know but how we're acknowledging <laughs> what has happened um and so i want to start by asking miss cunningham and miss blackman because you two are extraordinary civil rights activists who have laid the pathway for young people like us to follow. Can you give us a bird's eye view of the role that rural people and rural young adults play in the fight for civil rights? Carol, do you wanna go first or you want me to go first, Amanda? Um, the role that I played uh, in the 60s uh, as a student uh, was influenced by people that came from other states uh, into the rural area. Uh, we had just integrated schools. Um, some were integrated and some were in the process of being integrated. 
And these students were aware of issues and they had come in contact with overt racism. And they were aware of what was going on as far as discrimination was concerned and the injustice in the state. And all we did, and all the students that came from other states, all they did was come in and go into the communities and made those people aware of the issues because they, the older adults weren't, weren't aware of these, some of these issues that the students were having in school. Uh, we went, uh, I guess, uh, in my area, we went like from door to door. Uh, the students who came in had set up freedom houses in different areas. And we used those to really educate people and to get them involved. Um, that continued for me. I mean, I went from that to uh, the NAACP. I, I, I worked with SNCC. Um, I worked with a local group called Voters League. And we were really proactive and not reactive. Uh, when we planned the 1964 convention with Bob Moses, who was a brilliant person, we had our own elections. We had we started the precinct, went from the precinct to the district, from the district to the state. We ran our own candidates, we did our own voting. And we were just new at it, but we learned. Um, that's kind of how I got started and where I continue to be um, working now with Carol, uh, with, um, the BBM, which is sort of what the same thing we were doing because the main purpose then uh, with BBM is getting people to vote and registering people to vote. And we do have young people. I was just telling her yesterday or this morning that we are working with a group of young people called the New Black Panther Party that we're trying to get them involved. Um, and registering people and voting people. Thank you for that, Miss Cunningham. That was a history lesson. And now, Miss Carol, I don't, you know, I know you can, you know, do your magic, but can you tell us, you know, from your bird's eye view, the role that rural and rural young adults play, played and play um, in the fight for civil rights? Sure. Thanks, Amanda. And um, thank you all for having me on this panel today. Um, well, I grew up in rural Mississippi in uh, the county of Madison and in, um, in an area called Canton, even though we didn't really live inside the city, we um, still lived in, in a portion of Canton. And um, during the time when I was growing up, I heard a lot from my father and my grandmother about what was taking place in our community around civil rights struggles. And the, the main goal was to help pe black people in the community register to vote. There was a lot of violence that was taking place. Um, ultimately, I remember that a number of black people were beaten, churches were burned. Um, and I recall, um, sitting somewhere listening to my father and my grandmother's conversation when they were talking about what her strategy would be um, to be able to register and vote. And they talked about um, taking possession of my older sister's Mississippi history book so that my grandmother, who we call Granny, um, could actually um, learn portions of the Mississippi uh, Constitution and the preamble to that Constitution to help her prepare for the protest. And then um, I recall that uh, there were these boycotts that took place in our community, that uh, in our town that really 
caused a lot of ruckus. And then by the time I was in um, high school, in the 11th grade, the voting age changed to 18. And so I recall one of our um, high school teachers, and teachers, you know, had a lot more uh, flexibility back then. One of our high school history teachers decided, uh, government teachers, that we needed to become engaged in the process. So he took us out one day and we actively went door to door. We had some minor training, uh, but of course we didn't really know what we were doing, but he, he provided some minor training for us and we went door to door asking people to register to vote because by then the rules had changed, even though um, before that, a number of black folk across Mississippi were entered into what was called the Sovereignty Commission files, which were uh, files that were maintained and paid for by the legislature, the Mississippi state legislature, so that they could keep tabs on black folk who were trying to register to vote and who were getting other uh, black people registered to vote. I also remember that uh, while I was 17, I was able to register to vote because in a couple months, I was going to be 18. And so I've, I've been voting ever since then. Um, now, um, a few years ago, I learned that I'm what they call a super voter. Um, I vote whenever there's an election. Um, also, um, a community activist in the sense that every professional job that I've had has been geared toward helping to build the power of African American people. And usually it's either through voting or demanding rights um, in communities where we live. Wow, I hope you can hear the one million uh, hands clapping <laughs> for you and Miss Mamie uh, because there was so much history and just everything that y'all just said. I just saw two terms at the opposite end of the spectrum. I heard you say poll tax, which is something that so many people have no idea about or existed or what it was and what it did. Then I heard you say super voter. Which, which is something you could easily become today, a super voter if you want, you know. So that was so brilliant. Thank y'all for sharing that. I'm going to turn it over to Marlene um, so we can keep it rolling. Thank y'all for sharing that. Yes, no, thank you so much to both of you. Just again, laying out the history and the work that you've been doing and why you got involved into this work. And I'm going to kick off the next question I, uh, to both Abby and Juan, really, you know, now that <laughs> we heard from, you know, our extraordinary civil rights leaders, what brought you all to this work and what has sustained you to this work? Mm -hmm. Take it, Juan. Uh, hi, thank you all for uh, having me here today. It's really uh, wonderful to be in a community with everyone here in, in this panel and everyone who's watching. Uh, one of the things that really stood out and that from Carl that you said was, you know, that, that, your, that, that your grandmother believed was to borrow the, the textbook to learn the preamble uh, of the Constitution so she could recite it and get ready for the protest. Um, you know, that, that, that resonated with me because my mom, one of the stories when she was little, um, really took the like when, when she was just she 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 grew, she's from the united states but she grew up in mexico and she came to the united states much later in her life so she didn't know english but she in, in social studies and in, 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 uh, she had to memorize the preamble and she took uh, she always speaks of that moment and that when she was able to recite it uh, with so much pride because it was part of that civic engagement and part of being able to to even if you don't know the language and even if you don't know the political system understanding that you are a part, that you can be a part of this. And you know, what has brought me to this work, honestly, uh, I, I started activism uh, or being engaged in, in the community to the extent that I am now, uh, out of necessity. I live, as you see right behind me, there's a no border wall sign. And in the introduction, we spoke about the no, uh, how I, I, I was a part of the mobilization effort to really get out, get people out into the street to protest the border wall, and we were successful in the cancellation of two contracts in our in our in our in our city, and uh, two and two contracts in our uh, two other contracts in our region, 
Um, so really, like that, 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 that there, there was no other option for me to, to but to join this fight and to, to, to really jump in with everything I had. I live a hundred, uh, I mean, a hundred, about a thousand feet away from the Rio Grande. So Mexico is right behind me, a thousand feet away. So really, it's a, er, and the wall would have cut straight through this community. Uh, but what has sustained me through this, uh, through this work, and I think it was, I, I, I kind of touched on it. Uh, it's it's might be my family. Uh, no, uh, no, and this I'll say in Spanish for everyone um, because Laredo is this predominantly Spanish-speaking city. Lo que me sostiene en este en este en nuestra lucha es entendiendo que muchas 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 veces nosotros es, no, no no deberíamos de ser parte del sistema político. Nosotros no te, deberíamos de tener acceso. Mi familia vino a los Estados Unidos como braceros y y trabajaron en los campos uh, uh, para uh, uh, harvesting the food for that, that fed America for so many generations. And it is only until it, it is only until now that we are able to actually engage in the political system, because, like I said, we were never really meant to be part of this uh, about the, of, of this process. Yet we are here and we are willing to stand up for our community. Thank you so much, Juan. That was amazing. I, I just really, really quickly want to say that, you know, my deep belief in democracy is founded in a belief in human rights. And so that manifests both anger and love. And so I, I think that, you know, my experience, you know, since growing up and learning about the inequities and injustices in, in, in my area and elsewhere, really manifested both the anger, but also reminded me how much I love, you know, the people who I'm around and the people who I work with now. And what keeps me in that work is the community, right? Is that it's not sort of life and activism, it's the work at the intersection. Um, and so that for me is what has really sustained this work. Um, for quite a long time and keeps me in it every day because I know it affects people who I love and kind of keeps that anger going um, pretty regularly. Thank you very much, um, Abby and Juan, for sharing your stories and why you are involved in this process. And something that keeps kind of resonated from, you know, from the past to present is the fact that, you know, it's very true that we were not meant to be part of this, you know, process, right? I mean, it, we have come, come a long ways, right, to fight, you know, for our right to vote. Um, and, you know, 2020 elections were, you know, you know, quite a precedent. We had near record numbers of young people voting. However, there's still an issue in our democracy in America and how we're really going into rural America and how we're engaging young people. Um, we continuously, you know, I've continuously heard about the importance of voter registration. Um, however, I think that there continues to be this misconception of rural America where rural communities um, are kind of placed to be homogeneous, right? Um, but rural America is very diverse. We have our own identity, our values, and set of issues. How do you talk to people in rural America? And then the second piece to that question would be, what challenges do young people in rural areas and small cities face? Don't be shy, anyone can jump in. <laughs> um, I think that, um, the way that, that we talk to um, people in rural America is we meet them where they are. Um, I, um, as um, Amanda said in my introduction, I work with about 20 uh, groups in my role as the Black Voters Matter uh, state organizing manager. And every one of those groups are different. Every one of the leaders in those groups are different. They all have a common goal. The 80% um, of the groups that I work with are in rural areas uh, across our state um, because we, we're very rural. Uh, we have very um, broad um, rural area and each we uh, basically have four or five different types of rural in Mississippi. And so you just have to, I have to try 
I go in with an open mind and I try to figure out where everyone is and try and meet them at that level to have an open, honest conversation with them so that uh, they can feel that I'm really reaching out to fill them and their communities and to be supportive uh, about where they are and how to move uh, what their issues are forward. And ultimately, my goal is to help promote democracy, to help increase the number of African-American voters who are engaged in that process. And I think that um, rural people in general, um, when, um, and Marlene, you mentioned um, how rural people are pretty much perceived to be as one and easily defined. Well, um, I think, um, as I said, they're all different and they're anything but that. And um, that young people have, uh, they're so spread out, they're small communities. They um, oftentimes may have challenges with connectivity around uh, broadband, internet, uh, watching the wrong TV news. Um, I know that a lot of people in rural areas feel that they get their um, education around electoral issues from TV news, which is, uh, I think, a, um, a discredit to them. And I think that there needs to be more homegrown opportunities for um, young people in communities to feel connected to the rest of the world and to the rest of our country about what is going on and what the real lay of the land is and the roles that they can play in actually making a difference in their own communities and bringing about community change. My whole life, I've always thought about their rules and these rules need to apply universally and they should actually help to change the playing field or level the playing field for everyone who's engaged. My connection with uh, young people is similar to Carol's. I find that it's best to go into the neighborhoods. Uh, we do a lot in the churches. Uh, we pass out material when there's an election, uh, when um, we need feel that there's a need to register people that haven't been registered. In fact, I got three people who just moved in my community. And I'm going to contact them directly. I do a lot of contact with young people because I'm a former school teacher through social media. I got me a whole group in this city, got me a group in this city and got a group. And when we want to have a rally, a lot of times I want to get them out to rallies and things that we're having. I just get on the uh, social media app and they don't always show up, but we do get people to show up that way and to come out. And uh, we, and I, I, I do this uh, also with issues that are coming up to be voted on. I tell them what the issues are and who uh, perhaps may be the best candidate to vote for. I don't tell them who to vote for, but I tell them, I give them a little background information about the person that is that that are running. We recently had a supervisor's election and a lot of people didn't know these people, but I knew how they had voted. Some were incumbent and some were new uh, leaders and uh, I mean, new candidates. Um, I do that and um, I have gone into schools and passed out voter registration application to seniors, uh, left it with the um, secretary or the principal to uh, pass out to them. And what I usually do, um, when I get someone, uh, when I get them to fill out an application, I always go back and pick it up. I don't trust them to mail it in. So usually I just give them out, go back, pick them up. If I don't do it on the spot, I pick them up and return them to the courthouse myself. Um, that 
those are ways that I reach young people. And like I said, through the church, you have to go in these churches um, and not a whole lot of people are there, but you can make connection with their parents and you can ask them about who is resident in the household and who is not. Um, we do rallies. I've done several rallies with um, Carol and we have um, the New Black Panther Party participating in every rally that we've had and every meeting that we have, they always show up. Uh, those are a group of uh, young people that a lot of people who haven't associated with them, they, they are trying. And uh, I think we're gonna try to embrace that group also. Um, I do telephone calls, but my greatest success is has been meeting people and talking with them in their neighborhoods and in their homes and, and on the street, I do that too. Um, we meet a lot of young people on the street and we ask them, are you ready to vote? And a lot of times there's that, no ma'am, I got a, uh, what is it, a felony? I said, but it, is your felony, does it stop you from voting? When they tell me what, is, what it is, most times it's, uh, it's drugs. And I said, no, you can risk the vote. We do, we just get them where we can, where they are. Thank you for that, Ms. Cunningham. Um, mm -hmm. And I know we have a lot of conversations around disenfranchisement. I know this is what you were talking about near the end about, you know, people mm -hmm. not knowing what kind of crime, you know, they're just, just the impressions that we have from years of <laughs> civic abuse. Um, I was thinking while you were talking, I was um, thinking about Juan and I was thinking, um, you know, you talked about how special it was for you and your family to experience your mom um, learning the preamble or learning that part of the Constitution. Was it only family that like, do you remember your defining moment or this moment that that sparked in you? Um, I need to get out. I need to get out and do something, right? Because a lot of times people hear stuff in their heads and maybe I can send a tweet or, you know, but I know you were out there on the front lines as a young person. And so did you have a moment like that? And do your peers have moments like that? Like what's what's driving y'all right now? Yeah, I mean, I think I've always kind of had this political mindset. Uh, I know it started around high school. It wasn't really cultivated, but you know, I had an opinion or I was able to form an opinion. It wasn't always the, the opinion I would stand by now, but it was definitely uh, I was like the process of really thinking critically about the world around me. And you know, I started uh, that was in high school. I did experience that, and then through college, uh, I was involved. I was involved on campus, and I did kind of receive. Some training from like the student student government on how to leaflet and how to approach people about you know certain issues and how to hold like uh, information sessions. So I did kind of have that. I did kind of uh, I did go to college and I did experience that. And yes, uh, I do have friends that are you know political animals. You know, uh, <laughs> my friend Tanya Benavides, she's running for Congress uh, up against a almost what is it almost twenty years in, uh, in, in incumbent. So yeah, we're really, we're, and we're using the, the skills that we know, the skills that we've acquired up until this point in our lives to really get out there and uh, really to touch on, to kind of talk about like the, 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 the assumed homogeneity of rural, of, of, of the border. You know, it's, it's rural America, but it's also the border. And I think it's one of those commu uh, uh, communities that were just assumed we were going to always vote within a certain block. Uh, so, and, uh, and for this, I'll kind of talk about what my first canvassing experience. So I had done a lot of like leafletting and talk to people outside of businesses and stuff, but I had never actually gone to knock on someone's door to find them and to talk to them. So this was in a town just south of Laredo. And it was kind of, it was an interesting experience. And it's a, and I, I'll use it just to juxtapose kind of like that hopeful uh, youth, uh, 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 hope, like youthful hope for the future and really what has become because of this process of assumed homogeneity and this uh, 
uh, and in really not and taking advantage of voters and taking them for granted. So in this uh, conversation, it was uh, canvassing for a uh, board for the board of law, and it was uh, to talk to a property owner or a small property like a homestead owner that was going to be impacted by border wall construction. And he uh, basically was very pessimistic about our our intention, uh, not so much our intention, but uh, what we were able to accomplish. And he was kind of telling us that all these problems that have arisen have been, have, you know, all these like all these politicians and all these campaigns have continuously come through uh, year election after election. They ask for votes and then they leave, but they never fix anything. And at the same time, not so much that life is getting worse, but life is, you know, becoming more dynamic. And there are no solutions that are being delivered other than border militarization, because that's a thing, and mass incarceration. And, and I say that because he, he specifically pointed towards like the 1994 uh, crime bill that was sponsored by President uh, Joe Biden. And, and that's kind of where he was coming from. And at the end, we weren't really there to, 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 to talk about uh, uh, like the election. We were there to talk about the wall, but he basically uh, like told us that to, to keep fighting uh, because he believed in us, but at the, like there is going to be a point where we might realize that you know things might not change unless we uh, and I think that's where our drive even comes from now. Like the that that well <laughs> now that I have that conversation now things need to change so that people so that I don't grow up to ha have that mentality and so that people can actually have faith in democracy. Um, so yeah, that, that that was one of the experiences that I had. And in terms of the talking to young people, uh, it, it, I will say that there's a lot of energy in Laredo and in, in the surrounding areas and in Zapata County and in Webb County. There is a lot of the volunteers that I've worked with that have come out to knock on doors to talk to people have all been people that are not of age to vote. So they were 15, 16, 17 year olds that saw a, a post on social media and they're they don't even know who sometimes who's on the ballot or what the election is about. They just want to, they just know that the wall is, or the, because we're doing the wall, they just know that that's an issue that they, they don't want that here. And they're willing to go out and do it, learn uh, uh, so that they can kind of, uh, so that they can do their part and in, 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 in engage in the way that they can until they're eligible to vote. There is so much enthusiasm in your voice and the way that you tell your story that it can't be ignored that I know that same enthusiasm and fire is when you are knocking on people's doors and, you know, calling and texting and um, galvanizing your, your community. So I just want to thank you and celebrate you for that um, and let you know, you know, you were talking about what you did in high school and college and I was like, how, how old are you now? Because you, <laughs> to me, I'm like, you are just getting started. Like, what do you mean? So I just wanted to compliment you. You got a long, a long way to go. And uh, to thank you for that. And I want to remind the audience to submit questions um, in into the chat or into the portal. If you have anything that you want to ask the panelists or ask myself or Marlene, drop your questions because we want to try to answer those too. So thank you all for that beautiful, beautiful response. I'm going to turn it over to my homegirl Marlene. <laughs> yes. So um I you know this conversation, you know, again it's you know really thank you all for sharing this. And you know I want to kind of turn it to Abby. Because I think, you know, there is a lot of energy in the communities. We're seeing a lot of, you know, community outreach and education happening. We're seeing, you know, Ms. Cunningham, you mentioned about a new group, you know, the Black Panthers movement kind of, you know, bringing that back up. Um, Carol, you're doing so much with Black Voter Matters work, Juan, and the border wall. So there's this energy that is in rural America, right? So what is, you know, taking all that into account, Abby, what role did the 2020 elections play in rural voting patterns and what lessons can be taken away to generate more rural, rural voter turnout? Well, you know, thank you so much, Marlene, and, and thanks for everyone for this great conversation. I mean, you talking about the energy that's there. You know, this is one of the things that we see in data when we regularly collect it. So, for example, in our post-election survey after the 2020 election, we heard from BIPOC youth in rural areas that eight in 10 youth said, it's my responsibility to get involved and make things better for society. And almost eight in 10 rural BIPOC youth also said, people like me should participate 
in political activities and decision making of this country, right? So the interest is there. But what we've seen election cycle after election cycle is that the access isn't there. That there is a huge rift in what what some people, especially folks, you know, in, in philanthropy think is the issue and what's actually the issue. And so we saw historic turnout, as you've mentioned, in 2018 and 2020, historic youth turnout since the 26th Amendment was passed. But what we don't see in that data is the differences in access amongst young people. And this is why we haven't yet fulfilled the vision of the 26th Amendment. And so, you know, Virginia just had uh, an off-year gubernatorial election. And so one of the things that my colleague Kelly did before this election was look at 2020 turnout in Virginia. And what we saw was that the places where there was higher youth voter turnout are the places in the exurbs of Northern Virginia and the real urban areas of, of Virginia. And youth voter turnout was lower in the rural areas. And we actually have this data for 2016 and 2018 at the county level on our website, if people are interested in checking that out. And one of the things that I think is really critical to understanding this is that when, when People are reaching out to young folks, right? And we're gonna, I hope we can talk about this. Usually it's like parachuting into communities, right? And not investing in the homegrown efforts that Ms. Blackman was talking about, or the youth leadership that, that Juan has been talking about. And so, you know, in 2018 and 2020, we believe that the data shows that it was young people who were leading this historic increase in turnout, and especially young Black and Latinx women um, who were leading movements around issues. And so if we really want to learn from what happened in 2018 and 2020, we need to, to shift our thinking around elections entirely. And our director talks about it as shifting from thinking about mobilizing people to thinking about growing voters. Right, where young people matter regardless of who you think they're, they're gonna vote for or whether or not you think that they're gonna vote at all, right? Regardless of race, family background, neighborhood. And you know, again, like Ms. Cunningham suggested, this means being proactive instead of reactive, right? Instead of focusing elections and outreach on people who voted already, let's focus on supporting people who've never it means having year round conversations and, and, and not waiting until the last three months before an election to reach out to people. And so this is one of the things that we call growing voters. And a perfect example of it was what Juan just talked about with respect to young people before they're eligible to vote or maybe not even eligible to vote participating in elections, right? And so how can we think about a more robust strategy to invest in things that are homegrown for Ms. Blackman, that are growing voters per lawn, um, and that are real proactive per Ms. Cunningham. Because these are the lessons that we've learned over and over again in 2020 and before, that we need to invest in young leaders and we need to invest in the work of communities that's going to sustain any election cycle. Uh, to add to this question, I think uh, one of the, and then to kind of build on the last question and tying it into this one, uh, there's just like this assumed, like in South Texas, there's, there was, it's always been assumed that we would vote in a certain, like we're vote, a voting bloc that votes a certain way. And what you saw in this past election is that there is, you know, an effort to mobilize and to get a new voters that have never voted uh, out to vote, and it's giving them something to vote for. But um, we saw that you know the 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 the, the vote for like the Democratic uh, Party remained constant. But what we saw in 2020 in South Texas was an increase of new voters voting for the former president. Uh, um, it, it, like so basically saying that yeah there is like th this, this strategy has been identified and it's being utilized to the advantage of one party and unfortunately what i saw and what i experienced because i was out running i was like trying to organize and get out the vote uh in in the in 2020 is that the, the, there was like like abby said this last minute surge of money coming in it wasn't even three months i wish it would have been three months it was like two 
two or three weeks right before the election, the strategy that that was being used by the employed by the national like progressives and the Democratic Party was let's just infuse as much money and see where it takes us because there was this uh, hope that we get enough voter like energy uh, ener voters energized at the last minute in South Texas, we could flip Texas because there is enough voters here to do that. But obviously, like like we said, they're 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 coming in. They came in three 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 weeks before the election, bringing in you know Bernie Bernie Sanders was doing phone banking. There was Kamala Harris went down to the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, the, um, the 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 chair of the Democratic Party was here in Laredo the week the Sunday right before election day. But again, this this is all happening right before the election. I had already voted by that time. People, a lot of people had, votes had already been cast, and there wasn't like uh, like like was mentioned, it wasn't enough to really leave an imprint on the, on people's minds as to why they should vote for that person or for the set of ideas and for the set of values. It was just kind of throw money at it to see uh, see if it works. And and I'll, and the Republican Party I, I, does have this strategy kind of under like like uh, and they are building this strategy and they're investing in resources locally. They have the community center here. They've built a community center here in Laredo and they're building one in another one in McAllen, which is just south of in, in the Rio Grande Valley, so that they can train people to organize new vote uh, to get people to register to vote to get the, uh, to build momentum around uh, around conservative values. So, and because we were just assumed to always vote Democratic, the Democrats didn't have that. And now they're playing catch up and trying to really get to the level, to get to that level of investment and really reclaim the space. And it's gonna take some time and a lot of effort and really that grassroots uh, like organizing to get that to that point that we used, uh, that where we should have been, but we weren't at because we didn't have a long-term strategy here in South Texas. Um, I'd like to also respond to that as well um, <clears throat> and to expand a little bit on what Black Voters Matter does. I talked about the fact that we have these partners across the state to where we work and we're in um, the uh, deep south and southeastern states, but we're also uh, in Michigan, um, some parts of Texas and in Michigan. And so what we do with our groups and we will um, oftentimes work with nonprofit organizations, C3 organization, but we, what we do is provide them with mini grant support to help them build their capacity around their engagement level in democracy so that they have the resources on the ground year around to go out into communities, to work with people, to provide training. We um, not only have our senior organizing managers, but we also have what we call regional organizers that work to assist uh, the senior organizing managers in our state. We oftentimes find ourselves not only countering what is taking place nationally uh, around voter suppression, but quite often in small rural communities, there are these targeted efforts where um, where uh, leaders in the community who are engaged in voter registration, voter turnout, voter mobilization find themselves being charged uh, erroneously with voter fraud. And they're in these teeny little communities with maybe only a weekly newspaper. The um, television stations seldom go into these communities to follow up on any kind of news story. So the, the folk end up in like real um, trouble and the, uh, the um, prosecutors who charge them with uh, these voter fraud issues would then say to them, oh, let us offer you a plea bargain. So quite often these folk would end up taking a plea bargain. Sometimes it means that they can't run for office again or if they're in office, they have to uh, leave that office. But at a minimum, they really don't have the wind beneath their wings to take them back into the arena to continue the work that they uh, have been doing. Uh, for example, we've had a few towns here in Mississippi where um, 
elections have been recalled and well have been revoted where judges have gone in and said oh they're going to have to revote it in this election that election not the entire election but only in certain wards or certain seats or positions in those areas we've even had a young woman here who was charged with voter fraud and witness intimidation well she went to court they found excuse me they found her innocent of the voting fraud charge but they found her guilty of witness intimidation and lo and behold the judge set her sentencing at 15 years and the woman who she was accused of intimidating as a witness testified at trial that no she didn't intimidate me I've known her since she was a kid and but she the judge gave her 15 years with 12 years to serve her case went to the appellate court the appellate court said that the circuit court had erred so they actually threw the conviction out and then lo and behold our state attorney general became involved in the case and called for the appellate court to rehear the case which they did and said again that she was not guilty of what they said she was with the witness intimidation the case went to the Mississippi Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that they thought that they were the wrong venue to be hearing it and so now it's still in limbo meanwhile this young woman who has spent almost three years in in a Mississippi prison sits in prison after the appellate court says she's not guilty while all of this is being played out where the in these small communities those kinds of cases are actually tampering down the number of voters who show up at the polls there was a recent election in that community in three wards and fewer than 500 people went out to vote brief comment on what Carol has said we have the same situation in Aberdeen next door to me here and the election was overturned but the point I want to make is that in 1964 we we had voter suppression but really you still got voter suppression today we are experiencing a lot of voter suppression with these elections that have been overturned because they say a fraud a witness tampering it's it's we haven't we haven't moved very far from where we were it's the point I want to make and if we're going to move I think we're going to have to try to do what Abby is saying doing get young people involved and to read the way to get them involved is to get them to run and to get something on the I mean get 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 some issues that affect young people to run on because then we had I had so many people want to vote this year because the mayor the marijuana initiative was on the ballot care we had people turn out and then I was looking at some stats about 2008 we had a 49% increase of young people voting that year more than any other group so we got to give these people something to vote for okay thank you so much miss Cunningham and miss Blackman thank you everyone for all of the input that you have put in this conversation if you could really quickly give us your bottom line as it pertains to the rural vote and rural youth vote something like if you had to complete this sentence what would you complete it with and the sentence might be rural communities need blank to blank how about that because I think 
everyone has said so much. I have heard so much <laughs> from each of you about needs assessments and what's really happening and what's going on there. And then if you could also tell the audience how they can keep in touch with you, um, you know, if they have some questions about your journey or some insight that they might be seeking. What do you think, Marlene? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's that's great. I think there were so many points that you all made today. And I think one of the most critical things, you know, um, is that um, I'm going to take kind of back to what Abby had mentioned about the data, right? Um, where there is still um, a need to have more civic engagement opportunities in rural communities. There are so many young people, especially in rural areas that are energetic, want to get involved, but we still see these deserts, you know, and um, um, in, in the study that you conducted right with your organization, Abby, I mean, 60% of rural communities live in civic deserts compared to 30% for urban and suburban communities. So there's clearly a civic opportunity gap for rural voters and in general, just rural young voters, right? And that is really the ask with this is like, we need to make more investment in rural communities. We need to make sure that, you know, that young people who are in rural areas, you know, they are engaged, they are facing challenges, they are pushing the needle to really, you know, really, you know, make their communities better, but there is a lack of investment. And I think you hit it right in the target, Juan, when you mentioned, and as well, Carol, and it's coming him, you know, it's the people on the ground who are doing this work. And I think that we're at a point where we're frustrated. I mean, I come from a rural area too, where we have national organizations, politicians that just come three months to six months, come and go. And then at the end of the day, who's picking up the crumbs? And I, I don't want to like be offensive in that way, but that's the truth. <laughs> it's us who are in those communities, organizing, engaging, you know, doing the outreach, right? And want to make sure that doesn't happen, that there's really actually like pipelines being created. Because that's another thing, right? That's across generational lines for political fault lines really have sort of felt in the sense they're not creating leadership pipelines for young rural uh, people to be leaders. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed. I think that could be another conversation itself. But going back to what Amanda said, we're hitting that time. So yeah, that bottom line, what is that ask? What <laughs> to the audience, to organizations, to national groups out there, like what do they need to do to really invest in rural communities? And then how can they get in touch with all of you? right, and learn more about the work that you're doing in your communities. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, that the same level of investment in uh, rural community democracy needs to be paid that that is being paid to uh, military recruitment from rural communities. Um, and I think that um, foundations should invest in small rural um, organizations and um, an organizational infrastructure. I think quite often that doesn't happen enough that foundations look more broadly at investing in larger organizations and in, um, 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 I forgot my thought, but I think that we need to have investments in small rural communities. I think that government needs to make those um, investments around democracy. We think about the number of leaders who are long-term leaders in, uh, say, in Congress who emanate from small rural communities. For example, our own congressman from Mississippi, Congressman Benny Thompson, comes from a very small town in Mississippi of fewer than a thousand residents. So I think that there needs to be particular focus on actually mobilizing and engaging rural America, which makes up roughly three fourths of the whole country. Um, and to what she was saying, I agree with what she said. Um, I think we need an issue, uh, incentive to draw their attention to uh, the electoral process. I don't know whether that means uh, running a, a candidate, investing in a candidate to do that, uh, investing in some kind of issue that, you know, young people want to accomplish. But I think we got to give them a reason to vote too. Uh, 
I think that, well, I'll speak for rural communities, but also like border communities, like Laredo is a small city and it's surrounded by pretty predominant, like pretty rural, very large expansive rural area for areas. Uh, and I'll say that rural communities need uh, like to be centered in the conversations that in it, like the, it, where decisions are being made that like, and their voices need to be centered in these conversations uh, in order to build like these long lasting social movements and relationships. And I'll use, uh, I'll use the, the, an example to kind of illustrate what that means. So I was in a call with a, a progressive organization a couple of weeks ago and they, I was one of two people from the community and they, the whole time they were talk, say, talking, they were like, we want to hear from people in the community. We want to hear from people in the community. We want to hear from the people in the community. That was said so many times in that call. And they directed questions at me that I was going to answer. But as soon as I started answering that question, uh, they basically, they said, uh, the moderator, which is now from, the, from our community, uh, was, uh, she unmuted herself and she was like, Juan, we don't have time to talk about that. And ultimately, and that just goes to show that there like these, you know, these national organizations that are like want to parachute in for an election uh, want to parachute in for a very limited time to perform a very limited function. They're not really in, they're not really, while they say that they want to hear from the community, oftentimes the, the culture that, of, of like this national politi political conversation pu it, it pushes out the, mo the people that are most impacted by the decisions that are made. And I think that's why, you know, when we talk about like disillusionment in, in the political process and the conversation that I, uh, I spoke about earlier uh, from my canvassing, um, it just kind of, those are the kinds of things that push people away. And it's, and it's really flipping that over and saying, no, we're actually going to value the input of people for here. And that is what we're going to base our, ourselves off of, not whatever interests and whatever money is that we, we're trying to follow. It's, it's the people and it's, and that's what we really need to be prioritized. You know, to Juan's point, I, you know, I can't stop thinking about this idea of belonging. And I know that this is something that the Rural Youth Catalyst Project is, is talking a good bit about because, you know, Marlene, you've talked about the interest, right? There is so much interest, so much energy. And sometimes that connecting interest to action is through belonging. Right, feeling part of something larger. And actually, in the past two elections, it's been like a little relatively high among young people. After the 2020 election, we heard two thirds of BIPOC youth in rural areas said they feel part of a group or movement that votes to express their views. But that could be so much higher, so much higher. And I really agree with what Ms. Blackman said about infrastructures and supports that promote belonging, right? And that can look a lot of different ways in different communities, um, but the support and the youth leadership to be able to like build that culture is, is truly, truly critical. One place you could start is really with school boards. I've always wondered why, you know, youth were not on school boards. Agreed. And, you know, that's somewhere to start with, if you're talking about infrastructure. And Ms. Cunningham, you're hitting the nail right there. It's mm -hmm. local governance. How do we bring it back, you know, to that local movement building? <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that from all of you. I'm in the background trying to catch my kids' school bus, but I'm here. So, so um, I like the way you brought it all into um, what's local because that's what's home. And I think the larger part of this conversation is about how to serve your home, how to serve your community, how to activate what's already there. We already have the tools and the resources. Uh, we have the language, we have the wisdom of the people who have gone before us and are still with us. And we have the ingenuity of the young people like Juan that are out here now. I wanna thank y'all for joining us for this beautiful conversation. Um, I know that you can find ways to connect with us through links that have been posted and information that has been shared. Um, this is such a joy and such an honor. And I just wanted to say thanks. I'm gonna hand it over to Marlene for her thanks and then see y'all when we see you. Um, also here uh, again, just an honor to be, you know, among such 
brilliant, amazing leaders, activists. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in to this really important conversation. This is just an initiation. Um, this, you know, please go home and have more conversations. And for those who are watching, remember, invest in rural communities, rural youth matter, rural voters matter. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I want to say a huge thank you for the time and energy and thought that you put in uh, and to the audience. We hope that this is just the beginning of this conversation for all of you. Uh, I'd like to leave you um, with a quote from the late uh, Congressman John Lewis um, and what he, when asked about the role of young people in voting rights, one of the things he said is, what I try to tell young people is that if you come together with a mission and it's grounded with love and a sense of community, you can make the impossible possible. And this whole conversation has been a reflection on a celebration what we've achieved, but also the long road that we have to go. An enormous thank you to the shoulders that we stand on of our panelists today. So, and to all of you in the audience, we hope that you'll stay with us in this work. If you're not already signed up for the Rural Assembly newsletters, uh, please make sure that you do that. That gives you uh, access to the ongoing newsletters that gives you, tells you about ongoing issues, events. You can tune in to the Everywhere Radio podcast with Whitney Kibble Co. You can get weekly advocacy alerts. Um, and then the next uh, Rural Assembly live stream will be in January, and it's with the Health Action Alliance. And it will focus on how rural businesses can support employees with children to take the enough time they need to get their children vaccinated. Uh, also, we talked about the limited news sources available for rural communities and rural young people. So we strongly encourage you to sign up and follow the Daily Yonder if you're not already getting into it. It is a very fresh perspective and it brings you, it's online news that brings you commentary and analysis for rural America to all the people in all the places. Um, and last but not least, uh, you should have seen the Circle uh, website dropped in the chat box, but we hope that you'll follow along uh, with the um, events and the research and the resources that they offer. And then, of course, we always welcome your collaboration with us at the Royal Youth Catalyst Project. We love to hear your ideas. We ask you to join forces with us. No idea is too big or too small. We're here to build opportunities for all our young people and to help every single young person realize their hopes and dreams. So we hope you have a great afternoon. Um, and again, an enormous thank you to Circle for partnering with us and collaborating to make this happen. For the Rural Assembly for making all of this platform and all of our outreach and our ability to do this work possible. Uh, and to all of you as panelists for your incredible work and to Marlene and Amanda for your brilliant facilitation. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>